Welcome to Impact, I'm Logan Healy. This episode is about people who go all out for their passions. In our first segment, we meet two teens who are quick on their feet while busting stereotypes. One tackles dance and the other just tackles. Take a look. It's demanding, dedication, masculinity. It's dedication, hard work, heart, body movement in general. It's amazing. There's really no other rush that you can get. You'll almost have like an outer body experience. I can't think of anything else that I enjoy doing so much. I am a ballet dancer. I am a football player. I get to finally play football this year. I played like flag football and that was really fun. So I thought that playing tackle football would be even funner. When I said it, they were like, wait, aren't you scared? And most of the girls were like, oh, well, if that was me, like I would not be able to be like get hit. I don't mind it because I, I could take a hit and I could be tackled. I just thought, oh my God, these boys are like 6'1", 6 6'2", 6 even 6'5", 250 pounds, where she's 5'2", you know, 125 pounds. I thought, you know, they're going to cream her. Left guard, pull, down blocks, power to the right, on one, ready? I was okay with it and I talked to her about, you're, you're going to be going against 17, 18 year old, you know, grown men, not boys, grown men that are playing this game. And as long as you want to do it, I'm okay with it. And also, I told her to make sure your parents are okay with it. She kind of held off a little bit. She was a little apprehensive in the beginning. I mean, I was all for it. Her mom was kind of on the fence about it. I was actually hoping that they would tell her no. It wasn't that I didn't want her to play. It was just more safety. It's kind of an unheard of thing to see too many gals playing you know, football overall. And then being the first one at this school in particular, you know, makes it that much more special. About 11 years ago was the start of So You Think You Can Dance and American's Best Dance Crews and all of those really big dancing TV shows. So I really wanted to do hip hop and I thought it was really cool so I asked my mom to sign me up for a dance. When he was about four years old, he wanted to do hip hop. I saw an uh, audition for the Nutcracker and I just thought it would be something that he would like to do. I learned a lot of stuff through YouTube watching videos of other male dancers. This is Carlos Acosta, a very big inspiration for me. Just the athleticism of the guys, just being able to jump and turn in the air, and I thought it was really interesting and something I wanted to do. My mom was uh, a baseball player and she played with the guys until she was about 15. My dad was very supportive and I mean, I was around a lot of boys and so I did a lot of boy stuff. It was intuitive for me to support whatever Brett wanted to do. I was very supportive. It's something, you know, that he likes to do. Just to know that he's put a lot of work into it and uh, he does very well at what he does. I am actually playing wide receiver and cornerback and I'm not really interested in kicking like most girls. We play mostly zone coverage on defense and that's more about being in the right spot and reading the play ahead of time. And she does a really nice job of that. That's why cornerback, she's fit in really well there. I like being a receiver and I like throwing the ball. Uh, sometimes I wish I was quarterback, but I gotta work at that. I'm trying to put too much spin on the ball. 
I wanted to start playing football because I grew up around the game. Well, this has kind of gotten into football because of me. I mean, I played when I was younger in youth football and then high school as well. Hey, grab it. I'll turn them that way. He'll tell me, oh, uh, straighten your arms more. Oh, get lower because you have to tackle at the waist. I mean, football here in our house is pretty big. Sundays, you know, we we almost watch every game that goes on just about from morning till night. I am not sure why I wanted to do sports. It's competitive. Of course, there's winning and there's losing, but it, it, either way, if you play good and you win or if you play good and you lose, you still tried your best and you gave it all you got. When I first met Brett, he was just a very excited little boy who was very curious and very interested in dance. And when he came to my classes, he struck me as someone who loved to dance. Honestly, I hated it <laughs> until I was about 9 or 10, 11-ish. I don't know, something just clicked. I went to Kirov in DC for a six-week summer program. You know, coming from a studio with being the only guy, it was really something that helped keep me with it and I really fell in love with the art form. He might spend about eight, nine, ten hours with me in the studio. Don't start promenading. You seem like almost out of promenade and I'm missing that beautiful line. So let her open. Sometimes we'll stay really late after hours and uh, his mother will be patiently waiting while we keep working until 11 p.m., midnight, even 1 a.m., depending on what we're working on. There's always improvement. You never stop learning, and that's something I really love about the art form. I really enjoy taking classes together because it gives a different environment, and um, you push each other in different ways, where men, it's more of who can jump higher, who can turn more. And with women, it's more of who can get your leg up and you know, who can stay on point and who has better feet and all of this stuff. Every once in a while, they will give specific combinations that are just for me. But otherwise, I'll either tweak something here or there to make it more masculine. Once in a while it is nice to go somewhere and be able to take a men's class, but on the other hand it, it's nice being the only guy because I get a lot of experience. Like for partnering I started when I was 11 and where most guys don't start until they're about 14. I know she can handle it. I mean, she's tougher than her brother, and her brother's pretty tough. I think, as a girl, you know your limits. It's not for all girls. If you are a girly girl, it's not gonna be for you. They're not gonna be out there to cater. They're, they're gonna be out there trying to push you to see if you deserve to be out there, which they've done to her. I really hope to play professional sports because that's something I really, really enjoy doing. People ask, why are you a dancer? And, you know, that's such a girly sport and, you know, but then you get to say, well, you're around a bunch of sweaty guys and I'm in the studio here all day with bunch of beautiful, you know, really in shape women. It's all very glitzy and very form-fitting and tight, so perhaps, uh, you know, that might make some guys feel uncomfortable. I've been to a couple of sports games, I think uh, we're not the only ones that wear tights. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> don't, don't football players wear tights? <laughs> I think it encouraged me to know that you know, there are guys out there that are doing it that can put on tights and be confident and be okay with it. Having the confidence is a key to some of his success. The yeah, dream company is Royal Ballet in England, kind of something I'm aiming for. 
I truly believe that Brett has the ability to have a professional career. He's extremely gifted, so wonderful to watch. He grows so fast as a dancer. Oh, my advice is not to be scared and to go out there and give it your all. Just go for it. If it's really what you love to do, do it. I mean, you have to show everybody that, yeah, girls can play and girls can do just as much as the guys. If they don't accept you for who you are, you really don't need them in your life. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to live with a thousand cats? There's a woman in Central California who actually does. She's among many cat lovers who go to great lengths for their feline friends. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Get it, 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 get
um, the health department was just sort of like, you want to do what? We're opening a cat adoption center that also has a cafe aspect to it. Our inspiration is basically everything Oakland. We're basically trying to build a tiny Oakland, a cat-sized version of Oakland in this space. The silliest part is that this is really all about the cats. Like the cafe is just a silly gimmick to put on top of it to get more attention to, onto these cats. Oh my goodness. My name is Anne Dunn, and I'm the founder of Cat Town. I used to be a volunteer at Oakland Animal Services, which is the city shelter, so it's a high kill shelter. It's not a terrible shelter, terrible people, but they just don't have the resources to operate. I was a volunteer there for about six years, and I started Cat Town because I saw how many cats are killed because they're scared. The cats that seem to be unadoptable are really, in most cases, cats that are just having a reaction to being in a cage. So our thing is you get those cats out of a cage and you see a different cat. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Anne and I met for coffee, just sort of casually started talking about traveling and how I wanted to go to Japan and how Japan has all these crazy cat cafes and cat islands of feral cats everywhere. started to talk about like why don't we have that here, how could we do that here, and how that sounded incredibly magical. So we're at Tokyo Cat Guardian. This one is probably most similar to what we're trying to do with Cat Town Cafe. Big rescue center focused on adoption. The cafes in Japan are all about cats that live in the space permanently their entire life, as, and what could we do differently with that here. We're really jumping through all these crazy hoops just to get our health permit so we can serve pour over coffee. It's been the most stressful and one of the more fulfilling things I've probably ever done. I have no experience running a business. I have no place running a business, but here I am running a business. <laughs> and it's going really, really well. It feels good, yeah. It's interesting because I see, I mean, most, most rescue groups, even though they're getting animals out of the shelter, they're still going to like pet food stores, like standing out in front of pet food stores with animals in crates and getting them adopted from there. And, and the animals are just like, I'm like not any more comfortable here than I was sitting in that cage. And why are you showing me like this? I mean, how, how is anyone going to make a connection? So I think that's, that a lot of times those adoptions, it's just out of pity. These cats are being killed because they're they're unadoptable. When it's really all you've done is you've put them you put them into an environment where they appear unadoptable. So it is our responsibility to change the environment. It it just lets the animals be themselves. It's like when you come here, the animals get to be themselves. They're not in a cage. Sometimes when you put a cat in a cage, you don't see the personality in there. It's a weird, magical environment to come and meet a potential companion. And I think people are bringing a really good energy into the space and even people who aren't interested in adoption, like every time we see people walk out, they're like walking out with a huge smile and they're it's just like, how, so how was the cat zone? And they're like, it was amazing. The Oakland shelter is completely full. Any relief we can provide them is just more free spaces for more cats to come in. Just trying to help the city shelter and find these cats new homes. I have much, much bigger dreams for Cat Town besides just doing these few programs is, is really changing the way that all of the rescue piece is being measured. It is my life's work. I feel fulfilled. When I started this, I had no idea that it was going to consume the remainder of my life. I'm now 66-ish, and I don't see me getting out of this anytime soon. I have no problem with keeping up, doing what I'm doing, and, and staying here.
Some like it hot, especially foodies. In our final story, we get a taste for how peppers are spicing up America's palate. After you eat chili, your mouth is like a burn. You get sweat like a fin hot your fat and you burn your eye. The regular heartbeat, the rapid breathing, the sweating, occasionally the dizziness. So Hohen Tank Quick Mao Han. Clearing the sinuses, causing you to sweat. California, known for its glitz and glamour, has another side that's rarely talked about. There are more than 80,000 farms sprinkled across the state, and one of the crops isn't exactly typical when thinking about agriculture, chili peppers. The 16th century fruit made its way from Mexico to New Mexico, and then to California through a man whose name is synonymous with chilies, Emilio Ortega. He planted his farm around 120 years ago in a coastal town just an hour north of Los Angeles. Little did he know that he was planting a crucial ingredient for all sorts of cuisines. California is so diverse. That's the wonderful thing. Some of the greatest chefs here come out of the Vietnamese community, the Korean community, the Chinese community, and they incorporate you know, what they grew up with at home. And so what, whatever style of food that they're cooking, they're going to bring these influences. Like Thai chefs who added their spicy menus to the LA food scene. Red bell. Serrano, pepper. Thai people like the spicy food. The chili is a very important ingredient. We use any dish of curry by Thai chili because it smells good and spicy. 80% of food they have to ingredient with the chili. Mm. Very good. A thousand-year-old cooking tradition depends on the little red and green marvels. Chinese hot pot. And the heat gets turned up with Korean dishes. And about 30 years ago, a Southeast Asian refugee introduced a different flavor. David Tran created a hot sauce that became a sensation. In 1980, Tran started his hot sauce business in LA's Chinatown. Today, most of the production is done by machines, but back then, all of the work had to be done by hand. The sauce David created is called Siracha. Tran's recipe depends on specific types of peppers that were common in Vietnam, but not so easy to find in Southern California. The market in the USA, the fresh chili is green chili, not red chili. We firmly with the hot sauce must be red. Now, 
变红了，快烂掉了。因为一向来他们都扔掉的，那我要送都要送给你的，那就买回来。The search for the perfect pepper led Tran to the Underwood Farm in Moor Park, a community not far from Ventura, where Emilio Ortega originally introduced his chilies. We need a bright red color, and the color is pretty important because the sauce is made out of the product. So we're looking for a, a jalapeno flavor, but we need more heat. You would taste this very end part, and that's going to be the sweet end. So that tastes you, you're not going to get any heat out of that at all. But it tells you what the sugar levels are. And then the heat, you're going to take a bite right here. And that's going to give you the capsaicin. So if that burns, which it's doing right now, it burns across your mouth and down, you know you got a good one. And I think that's one of the reasons for the popularity of sriracha. Because sriracha is not an extract of peppers. It's a puree of peppers. It's whole, ripe jalapeno peppers. It has more of the uh, fresh pepper flavor. That's why it's spreading so rapidly. We don't have to worry about the American restaurants. The restaurants will use it. They will find that it's good. So they will use it. 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 Sriracha isn't the only hot sauce in town, but it enjoys an especially enthusiastic fan base. There are even Sriracha festivals and cooking contests. Sriracha represents kind of a combination of the Southeast Asian tradition of making pepper paste, flavored pepper paste that, that they serve at the table, with the English and American idea of a liquid sauce. The chemical uh, capsaicin that makes food spicy uh, livens up the tongue, uh, brightens flavors, and it can be somewhat addictive since you also get release of endorphins. Food is something that you know, we eat every day and that's you know, cooked by our family, by our mothers, our grandmothers, our aunts, our uncles. We're so lucky to be here in California where we have such a wide variety and such diversity and such a rich heritage from all around the world. What you grow up with is part of who you are. You know, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you where you came from. That's it for this edition of Impact. Be sure to check out all of our episodes at uscimpact.org. Now, let's take a look at some of our upcoming stories. Hip hop is, is for change, to make things better. In the 90s, we started to dialogue about, you know, how cool we don't have a school? How come we have a center where we can come and practice and call it our own? A center that can facilitate our elements and people can come in and learn about the culture. They bite like a shark, where they, they grab and rip and tear. If you get a bite like that, you're more likely to be harmed. When I listen to music, I see colors in my head. There are other people like me who see colors in their mind when they listen to music. This unique blending of the senses is called synesthesia. <laughs>